Hi there, guys. This is Scott. Uh, welcome to Action Video Game Talk. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be a bit of a weird one, considering that I'm doing it on a fly and rushing it, considering I'm getting ready for work, and this episode's been delayed. And yes, I'm wearing a Turtle Beach headset to help me do this episode. The Pokemon Company International and Princeton Entertainment announced that they will be working together for an official Pokemon music orchestral concert series called Pokemon Symphonic Evolutions. The concert will include new orchestral arrangements of iconic songs for Pokemon Red and Blue all the way to the recent releases X and Y, and will include timed visuals from the games. Pokemon Symphonic Evolutions will premiere in Washington DC's Warner Theater on August 15th, 2014, and will be followed by a performance at Philadelphia's Mann Center for the Performing Arts on September 19th. More tour dates, locations, and ticket purchasing information has not yet been announced, but keep an eye on the Pokemon Symphonia's website for updates. The Pokemon's World Championships will also be held in DC the weekend of August 15th at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center. This isn't the first time a video game music concert has been arranged. The creative producers behind Pokemon Symphonic Evolutions have also worked on the Legend of Zelda Symphony of the Goddess Concert Tour, and the Final Fantasy Concert Series, Final Fantasy Distant Worlds, was hugely successful. Pokemon Music was recently updated and scored for the Pokemon Origins anime miniseries, so Pokemon fans could give that a watch to tie themselves over until August, and see what they might be able to expect in the upcoming concert. Okay, this first bit of news involves a Pokemon concert, or orchestra concert series. Now, it is always nice when they're able to do stuff like this, especially for video game franchises, like, you know, The Legend of Zelda had one, the or maybe two, and then there was Final Fantasy that had a couple. But it is nice that Pokemon, Pokemon itself does have great music, if you actually take a chance to actually listen to it. Well, I don't know if you consider, like, the red, blue, or I should say, if you consider the early ones aren't really, you know, that great. They were just, you know. Gamers on the other side of the pond will be able to get a new PlayStation 4 bundle that includes a copy of the newly remastered version of Naughty Dog's masterpiece, The Last of Us. The news comes from the European PlayStation blog. The bundle includes a standard black PlayStation 4, DualShock controller, and a copy of The Last of Us Remastered. It retails for 429 euros. At present time, this bundle is only announced for Europe, not the US. Okay, so this bit of news involves The Last of Us Remastered bundled with PlayStation 4 only for Europe currently. And that's currently. Now, of course, we do know later on they can actually say, oh, guess what, we'll bring it over here to the United States. But right now, it's over there in Europe, which isn't really a big issue. I mean, if they want to go and test it out over there first, see how well it sells, that's good. But I'm sure something like this will come here to the United States, and probably, you know, maybe other places in the world, too, that are able to get to it. If you've been in the market for a new PlayStation 3 controller, you might want to consider looking at something a bit more current. Sony stealthily added some support for PlayStation 4 controllers in the most recent PlayStation 3 firmware update. Reddit user Shafiggy16 has posted a tutorial on how to get your DualShock 4 up and running and the process is straightforward. The system won't automatically recognize the controller, so you'll need to register it as a Bluetooth device, similar to a remote control or a headset. That can be found under the accessories settings. Once your PlayStation 3 is scanning for new devices, hold the share and PlayStation buttons until the light starts blinking rapidly. On PlayStation 3, choose to pair the controller and you'll be in business. The PlayStation button on the DualShock 4 can turn on the PlayStation 3, but you won't be able to use it to return to the XMB within the game or bring up the options to switch controller assignments or power down the system. Alright, now, it seems that you can now use your DualShock 4 controller with your PlayStation 3, which is a bit weird. I mean, the PlayStation TV service that they're going to have is going to include a bundle with a DualShock 3 controller. 
and I guess that one could probably get changed over to a DualShock 4 controller later on, but as far as this, it kind of makes sense. I mean, they're both, you know, Sony products. It does have the same technology that it can use. So, after a successful alpha beta test earlier last month, Bungie is ready to send Destiny into beta. Players will be able to get another taste of the massive online shooter in July on all platforms. PlayStation 4 owners will have first crack at the beta, beginning on July 17th. New information has surfaced that Xbox 360 and Xbox One gamers won't be too far behind. A trailer that was temporarily on Xbox One dashboards points to a late July arrival for the testing on Microsoft consoles. Bungie has confirmed that the Destiny beta on Xbox platforms will begin soon after the July 17th start on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 3. An Xbox Live Gold membership will be required to participate. Additionally, you will still need to pre-order for a voucher or obtain one via a giveaway in order to join the beta. Destiny will be out on Xbox One, Xbox 360, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation 3 on September 9th. Now, apparently we all know that the Destiny beta for Sony's systems is supposed to start July, I think it was 17th or 15th. But with this news, it says that it is coming to the Xbox 360 and Xbox One in late July. Yeah, here it is, July 17th for the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 3. But with Xbox One and Xbox 360, you do need the gold membership to participate. But with them saying that it's going to be late July... Uh, hopefully it won't be, you know, maybe like a few days before the end of the month. I mean, if anything, they could just wait maybe a week after, or, heck, if we're lucky, it might just be a couple days after. But Destiny is going to be an awesome beta when you're able to get into it, and we don't know how long it's going to be. It could take a couple weeks, but then again... The final game itself comes out September 9th, so we might not have a, that long to go through the beta. Destiny has been rated T14 by the ESRB due to the presence of animated blood and violence. Polygon reports that there is no mention of harsh language, gambling, tobacco use, or anything else that may invoke the ire of the board and cause them to tip it up to the mature section. The inclusion of violence is harshly surprising. But seen as there are also sections for the likes of intense violence, cartoon violence, fantasy violence, and sexual violence, it seems that Destiny is pretty straight-laced. Speaking to the site, Bungie explained, We've always set out to make games that lots of players can enjoy, and to build experiences that matter to people for Destiny. We didn't aggressively pursue one rating or another, though. We constructed foundational pillars that have guided development from start to finish. We wanted our worlds to be a place people felt good about spending time in. We wanted our worlds to be worthy of heroes. First, that means Destiny would never be reprehensive, though, but rather bright, hopeful, and adventurous. That's a word that resonates with us, and we hope it resonates with gamers, too. Now, Destiny is rated T for teen, which is kind of a given. I mean, for those who... For those of you who have played the alpha and have signed up for the beta, when you played the alpha, you notice there was no actual, you know, swearing, no gratuitous blood, no real mature, well, there was some immature people, you know, playing the game. But other than that, you know, Destiny rated teen makes perfect sense. I mean, they're not trying to be gory detailed like most of the games have, that are out there have to be, you know, Tons of blood, tons of violence, and tons of sex for some stupid reason. I mean, that's not the only thing that makes a good video game. I mean, a lot of people are going to buy lots of copies of the video game for that reason, but a good video game involves an actual story and being able to actually play the game. Although Kingdom Hearts HD 2.5 Remix releases later this year, the remix launch isn't interfering with progress on Kingdom Hearts 3 development. The game's co-director said in a recent interview, We've been working full throttle, Tai Yasu told Game Informer. It's moving along. 
We've structured our team in a way that development of 2.5 doesn't interfere with Kingdom Hearts 3. I'm actually very excited about Kingdom Hearts 3. Despite that many fans hoping for a new Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer at E3 this year, Yasu said 2014 is the year of 2.5 for Square Enix. The developer wanted to push 2.5 this year as it did with Kingdom Hearts 1.5 Remix last year in order to make the transition between titles smoother. Making teasers and trailers really does require a lot of work, and we just wanted to get the development moving along quickly on Kingdom Hearts 3. So this year, we really focused on 2.5, he said. Yasu said that much of the needed preparation comes from the fact that Square is moving to next generation console for the next numbered installment. Although the new technology presents an array of new opportunities, it still takes some getting used to. Now, there is a lot of people working for Square Enix, and it makes sense that there's going to be different teams work on, on different projects. And this is, gonna, it, this is some great news right here, that they do have that the HD 2.5 remix of Kingdom Hearts isn't going to interfere with the actual Kingdom Hearts 3 development. This is good news for Kingdom Hearts fans, although, you know, they're going to have people working on different projects anyway. Although, you know, my own opinion, they should have been working on one project years ago involving Final Fantasy VII! Square Enix! Dumbasses! Don't you want to make money? We don't know much about what's next for Gears of War, but a recent tweet from the actor who plays Augustus Coltrane Cole hints that his character may be involved. Lester Sprite played Cole in Gears of War, its two sequels and its prequel Judgment. In a tweet, a fan asked him if he had received a call about the new Gears, to which he simply replied, yep. We know developer Black Tusk Studio is working on a new Gears title after Microsoft acquired the rights from Epic Games. The studio manager, Rod Ferguson, recently jokingly teased the image you see, but other than that, what's in store for the next Gears game is still pretty much a mystery. Now, there's quite a few fans of the Gears of War franchise who like this Augustus Coltrane Cole character. I kind of find him annoying, but I, I enjoyed playing him with the Gears of War games. Although, like most people, I didn't really like the Judgment game because it was crap. But it's great to hear that you know the the voice actor for that character is going to be back for the seat for this next one that's going to be done. And this Rod Ferguson is jokingly teasing us with this image that's blurred out, which doesn't really help, but. Yeah, if Microsoft actually bought out the rights for Gears of War from Epic Games, and hopefully Microsoft will be able to do a better job than they did, especially with that Judgment game, hopefully they'll have something a bit more like some of the other games, like, you know, the first, second, and third one. Especially bringing back that Horde mode. A listing on Microsoft's online store is pointing to a July release date for a standalone Kinect. Connect 2.0 will be available separate from the Xbox One starting July 15th. Connect 2.0 will be available separate from the Xbox One starting July 15th. The standalone device costs $199 and is being sold more as a development tool than an entertainment device. Now, Microsoft actually having a standalone Connect for sale kind of, you know, is going to make sense because they were going to do it since they're going to have like a standalone Xbox One without Connect. The major issue here is the actual price for the standalone Connect. $199, about 200 bucks. Even though what, it was just like 100 bucks less to take it out of the actual system. Why they're charging more for it by itself? Yeah, <sighs> you know, not everything right now with the Xbox One games and the Xbox One system, they're trying to focus, or we're trying to focus on the actual Kinect for everyone to actually have and use. To be honest, the Kinect isn't really mandatory all the time. I mean, gamers just want to play their game with a controller. That simple. 2K Sports and the WWE have announced their cover superstar for this year's most electrifying game in sports entertainment. John Cena, who just became a world champion for the 15th time at 
the Money in the Bank pay-per-view will adorn the cover of this fall's game. Cena will be the first cover star for the WWE game on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. The official WWE game's Twitter account shared this image of the PlayStation 4 box art to coincide with the announcement on Monday Night Raw. Now, John Cena has been on the cover of a lot of WWE games in the past. And, more or less, John Cena is and has, has been the face for the WWE for many years. So it makes sense for him to be on the cover, especially for this next generation one, the debut for next generation of a WWE game. But, you know, they're whole playing it out because, oh look, John Cena's our new world, our new WWE world heavyweight champion. Let's be nice and make him the cover athlete for our game. I mean, this kind of makes sense for John Cena to be the cover athlete, well, if you want to call him athlete, but it does make sense for John Cena to be the cover person for the first PlayStation 4 and Xbox One version of the WWE game. When I can say that name, WWE game. And like I said, he's been the face of the company for years, so he has accomplished a lot, especially with this Money in the Bank pay-per-view. He became a world champion for the 15th time, but Concern it's kind of two tiles. Wouldn't that make him kind of 16 times instead of 15? A new update for Grand Theft Auto Online offers tons of discounts to players, but also adds the ability to ride Pleasure Pier's Ferris Whale and Leviathan Roller Coaster. The Independence Day special offers a huge collection of updates and promotions, including Star Spangled Vehicles and Clothing, a Musket a fireworks rocket launcher, new properties, new jobs, and double Grand Theft Auto dollars and RP for a limited time. You'll also find discounts on assorted weapons, ammunition, and airstrikes. Now it is nice when Grand Theft Auto Online has these additional updates, well, patches or whatever, where it's for like a special occasion like Independence Day. And you got some special clothing, vehicles, a musket, which is weird, a fireworks rocket launcher. Of course, that's assuming you're actually able to buy a rocket launcher. New properties, new job. And of course, you know, most of these news articles are going to be kind of a week late. But I don't know if all this stuff is still going on right now, especially on Grand Theft Auto Online. The last time I was on Grand Theft Auto Online, I tried getting on again after the last update that they had, but concerned that they had a bunch of well, fucked up people on there. I didn't even want to bother being on that long, so I didn't get to check out all the additional updates that they had. Because, you know, when you go online, you have to join this massive amount of people who shouldn't even be on there. Rockstar should be able to do, like, your own separate online session. But they don't do that. They do this bullshit. The formerly download-only Gone Home is now available in retail form with some added goodies. The special edition of the game is $29.99. Included in the bundle is the game on a disc as well as a download code redeemable on Steam. You'll also find the game's soundtrack and all of its audio diaries in MP3 form. A special poster featured in the game, a sticker, a 40-page designer's notebook, and a special Lisa Frank inspired DVD case to hold the game. All packaged in a box that has been mocked up to look like a Super Nintendo version of Gone Home. Now it is nice when actual video game companies try to do a little nod to old generation systems like this. This uh, retail special edition of Gone Home comes in a Super Nintendo type box packaging. I like that. You know. It proves that they are gamers, and that they, I guess, they do miss the old Super Nintendo games, which, there were some awesome games for the Super Nintendo, that, you know, no matter how great the graphics are with these new generation and current generation games, nothing's going to be able to beat some of the gameplay that you've done on the Super Nintendo games. Voice actor Bob Hastings has passed away at 89, after a battle with prostate cancer. While he will be remembered most by geek culture fans as the voice of Commissioner Gordon on Batman the Animated Series and related DC cartoons, 
Hastings also performed voice work for video games. Hastings began his career performing radio dramas and made the move to television in, in the late 1940s. He played the role of Lieutenant Carpenter in McHale's Navy in the early 1960s and appeared on an episode of Batman with Adam West and cartoons, including the Batman Superman Hour, 1968, the new Scooby-Doo movies, 1973, and The Amazing Spider-Man, 1977. Hastings was also the voice of Commissioner Gordon in Batman Vengeance, 2001, and Batman Rise of Sin 2, 2003. He also did work for Jack and Dexter, the Precursor Legacy, as Mayor Manic. His final role was as a judge in Mafia 2 in 2010. Now, this is, of course, some sad news. I mean, most people do remember Bob Hastings for the voice of Commissioner Gordon from the Batman animated series, along with the actual video games that were done based on the animated series. Uh, right now, I have up Bob Hastings, well, his IMDb actual page, and looking at his work on here, sorry if I was a little off on that, but... Uh, yeah, his last actual voice acting was for Mafia 2 as the judge in 2010. Uh, he, yeah, he did a lot of Commissioner Gordon voice acting. I mean, he was even in an episode of Static Shock. Uh, the Batman, I guess, straight to video DVD movies, uh, Superman TV series, uh, Mask Phantasm Batman movie. He was even involved with, with some TV series and actual physical being there roles, like uh, Major Dad, he was in Murder, She Wrote, The Dukes of Hazard. wow. Let's see, General Hospital, The Monsters' Revenge, Monsters, hmm. The Waltons, Three's Company, the Incred he was in the Incredible Hulk TV series, wow. Wonder Woman, he, he was involved in a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. He was, he was even in the Care Bears. The Care Bears. That's the funniest thing of all. Uh, let's see if it, let's see if I can get it, scroll down to uh, his, his earliest stuff. Yeah, a lot of Saturday morning specials are listed too, like ABC ones, CBS ones, which, you know, most of us that grew up with that stuff remember those. Uh, Green Acres. He did a lot of sheriff roles too. I Dream of Genie. Wow. Uh, let's see. Superboy. Wait. He was Superboy? Oh, wait, he probably voiced Superboy. Never mind. Yeah, he was in the Monsters as the Raven. He was the Raven in the Monsters? Let's see. McHale's Navy. Yeah. Petticoat Junction TV series. Twilight Zone. Oh, he did an episode of Twilight Zone. Uh, Dennis the Menace. Car 55. Where are you? Let's see if I can find his early stuff. Uh, wow. Captain Video and his Video Rangers. He played the role of Hal. That was back in 1949. But man, this this guy did a lot of actual acting and voice acting. It is a shame that he died. That especially this way. The what was it? Prostate cancer. Ugh. But he did get to live a long life, and a lot of people remember him. Borderlands the pre-sequel comes out for Xbox 360, PC, and PS3 on October 17th. And from there, developer 2K Australia says anything can happen. Game Reactor TV interviewed some of the guys at 2K Australia, and studio head Tony Lawrence didn't rule out a new-gen version of the game. If fans say, hey, we'd really like this on a next-generation console, well, we'll think about that. But right now, we're concentrating on the consoles we know. Franchise director Matt Armstrong added that requiring people to buy new hardware in the middle of a series feels a little disingenuous. 
but added that they'd had to see how people react to the game first. Now, I remember there being talks about the next numbered Borderlands was going to be on the new generation systems, but with this bit of news, the Borderlands pre-sequel might be the first one to come to the new generation systems. But then again, they could just wait a while and then just bring out, you know, the first Borderlands, the pre-sequel, and the second one as far as like a Borderlands trilogy to the ne next generation systems instead. But, you know, this just depends on what 2K wants to do with the Borderlands franchise. Because, you know, we haven't heard anything official as far as from 2K with the new Borderlands numbered game. Whether it's going to be Borderlands 3, or if they're going to give it another subtitle, like this pre-sequel. Now, as far as the new releases, we're going to do both last week and this week's this time, because, you know, we didn't get around to last week's. But last week's new major re releases, we got Dynasty Warriors Gundam Reborn for the PlayStation 3, Sniper Elite 3 for PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, Xbox 360, and Xbox One. Call of Duty Ghosts Invasion DLC Map Pack for PlayStation 4, PlayStation 3, and PC. Far Cry Compilation for Xbox 360. Saints Row 4 The National Treasure Edition for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Now as far as this week's major new releases, we got One Piece Unlimited World Red for the Nintendo 3DS the PlayStation 3, the Vita, and the Nintendo Wii U. The Wolf Among Us, Episode 5, Cry Wolf for PC, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360. Mousecraft for PC, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and Vita. Might and Magic, Duel of Champions Forgotten Wars for the Xbox 360. Okay, so that'll do it for this edition of Action Video Game Talk. Thanks for joining me. And, you know, once again, sorry if this video is short and a bit rushed. And if you didn't hear me properly, because, you know, I did have the microphone away from my mouth a while. Plus, I got my fan on. It's freaking hot over here. So, uh, once again, I will be posting the link down below for the Facebook page if you want to check that out. Uh, give us a like over there. Follow us over there. Us. Yeah. It's mostly just me anyway, so... Or at least for now. I know, uh, I'm hoping to get back together with the uh, Reproid Productions crew to do uh, another episode of Action Video Game Talk with them. I know I said I was going to try to with, like, an E3 follow-up. It didn't get around to that. We, I think this whole weekend, we, everyone got busy with the 4th of July weekend and stuff, so. Uh, until next time, bye!